very decent exposition ending with a rather thrilling challenge. You are in line to be the third person in my entire life who has debated me and whom I think would provide a, a potent response. In fact, you did so well that the major argument I had in my arsenal after you went through all your texts, the major omission, the dynamite that I had to explode in your brilliance and your prescience, you might have anticipated that having quoted all of these texts with your essentials, and as you quoted the text about the Messiah and accepting that Jesus has come in the flesh and so on, I was writing. One could do that without accepting that Jesus is God. So as you are, as you are delineating, you must accept that Jesus is the only way. I say, well, that the witnesses do all of that. And, you know, God coming in the flesh, your John text, I had JWs. And in the end, I must say that you're adducing the Pentecost experience is a very plausible explanation and nuancing of the complexity of this discussion. I commend you highly for your systematic approach. I agree with every single one of the fundamentals that you identified. You began with the classic text of 1 Corinthians 15 of what Paul himself called a first importance. Jesus died and so on according to the scriptures. What I would note about Moses is that Paul emphasizes that Jesus died according to the scriptures by which he could only have meant the Old Testament. The fact that he put what was of first importance in the context of the Jewish scriptures would be significant to someone in my religious tradition where we say outside of that context of the Jewish scriptures, the Old Testament, as it is commonly called, we can't understand the birth of Christ. You mentioned one of the birth narratives, but you hadn't quoted that Luke text that says the Lord will give him the throne of his father, David, he will take over the kingdom, but right there in the, in the uh, Annunciation was this whole concept of the kingdom. So I want to say in commenting specifically on what you brought that I think you have identified some of the fundamentals. You emphasized the importance of the transformation of the Christian lifestyle. And I must point out 
this should not be said to be in contradistinction to me. Remember now that in a, in a debate, because of the nature of the debate, one would need to put emphasis on a particular line. It does not mean that other positions are not embraced with equal fervor. But it might mean in the context of the debate, there is a necessity to lay a stress on a particular point or set of points. And lest there be any misunderstanding, let me say for the record, and because this is being recorded for worldwide distribution, let me say that I accept that integral, 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 fundamental to Christianity is moral transformation. That righteousness is an essential aspect of Christianity and is an essential aspect of the definition of the Christian. The Christian is a person who follows righteousness, who has love, who has compassion. That is a part of the identity. So my seeming to de-emphasize transformation is not in my context of it is not to downplay it, but it's to say it. And I couldn't use that against you because you highlighted the theological distinctives and you put the transformation in the context of the theological distinctives. My beef is with those who only talk about transformation and talk about righteousness, meaning moral principles, outside of the theological context. So my debate will be with you. Because you have rightly highlighted the theological distinctives, rightly put the emphasis on that. But I cannot agree with those Christians obsessed with moral duties and moral issues and ethics and behaving as though that is what defines Christianity. That is not what defines Christianity. That is ignorance. All it takes is an understanding of comparative religions to know that the moral principles of Christianity are not unique to Christianity. And in an age when a lot of this information is not only hidden in books, that I have an obsession with, but so easily available on the internet, on your phone. There's no excuse to come with that ignorance. So, I accept that moral transformation is critical. In fact, in fact, Brother Moses, and you could not anticipate this, in fact, I so accept, I so accept that moral transformation is a big thing. That what I have as my primary line of argumentation tonight is that whole definition of righteousness and the definition of sin. Because what I want to say now is that in light of the agreement by all Christians that the plight involves sin. Mankind's plight is involves sin. And the solution is the Savior. Why is Jesus called Savior? Because he redeems us from our sins. So sin is central in Christian theology. Sin is central to the whole matter of the definition of Christianity. So I am very happy that you have gone there very happy that you went to the day of Pentecost because that was my first my first text is taken from that early sermon 
Acts 2, 38. Repent, be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Repent. What must you repent of? You must repent of sin. They might not have known that day you, you say well, that Jesus was God and they wouldn't know all the intricacies of theology. But one of the things they had to know one of the things that was fundamental to know on that day, before they could have been baptized, it's a matter of sin. They had to repent of sin. I think you would agree with me, Brother Moses, that the matter of sin is central. Not just to the New Testament, but to the entire Bible. But particularly in the New Testament, sin is, is central. You can't be more central than sin in that the very notion of a savior who rescues us from sins and all of these things is tied up with what sin is. And so I say, and you went to the book of John. In fact, you went to the same chapter. You went to John, first John 3. And I'm going to first John 3 also. The Spirit is moving, working with us tonight very well. You went to Pentecost, I had that as my thing. And you, you went to John. And I want you to read a little further up. You went to 8 to 10, I think. I want you to go a little further up. 1 John 3, 4. Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Because sin is lawlessness. The regular translation says sin is the transgression of the law. No. In my mind, Brother Moses, if sin is the transgression of the law, or is associated with lawlessness, no law, an antinomian position. If sin is the position of no law and is the transgression of the law, we would have to we would have to see what then is this law. If it is no law, no nomos, what is the nomos? It therefore has to be fundamental. And precisely because you have laid so much stress on righteousness, which is the opposite of sin, because you have rightly identified that as being at the heart of Christian identity. Righteousness. We have to know what righteousness is and what its opposite is. And I want to put it to you as a fundamental. Like the scripture says, sin is a transgression of the law or lawlessness. That if you as a Christian are guilty of breaking that law, now we have not come here to the term which law is. And that's not the point of our discussion here this evening. But if you are guilty of that, you would be guilty of sin. And therefore, your Christian identity, because you yourself have told us how important this righteousness is, your Christian identity would be in jeopardy. I take you to 1 John 2. Again, we're now talking about moral transformation. Moral transformation. And when we look at this matter of moral transformation, you know, I had an interesting debate with a, a non-Sabbatarian. 
and he raised a point of interest in the discussion. He didn't push it, but he found it interesting. He was saying that, that God never judged the non-Israelite nations on the basis of specific laws like Sabbath and so on. He judged them on the moral law because he said that basically God judges people on the non uh, ritual um, law and God expects man to you know follow up to that which which he can know through his conscience he was basically he was pushing a kind of a natural religion he might not know that's what he was doing but he basically was saying that um, God is really judging people according to the light of their conscience and according to what can be known I'm saying every civilization no adultery wrong and so of course I didn't bother to correct him I didn't bother to correct his anthropology you know everybody knows that and everybody knows that killing is wrong and all that sort of thing but when you look at the biblical definition of um, of, of, of sin though the biblical definition of sin has not only to do with those things that humans would know naturally but has to do with the commandments of Yahweh first John 2 1 my little children I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin and because Moses you raised this important enough the opposite of sin which is the righteousness if anyone sins, you have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ. He's appropriation for sin. Verse 3, and by this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. If we keep his commandments, we know that we know him. We do not know that we know him because of moral transformation per se, which can take place outside of what you would call a born again experience outside of a born again experience that's not language that's familiar in our tradition but I understand what it means outside of the born again experience one can experience moral transformation and so on here it is saying by this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments whoever says I know him but does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him There has been some attempt to say that these commandments of Jesus are just, they are different from the commandments of the Father. That, you know, these are the commandments of Jesus. And not the commandments of the Father. But let us go to 1 John 5. For those who tell now to me clever distinctions, well, Jesus' commandments have to do with, you know, love your neighbors yourself and so on. And, you know, Father's commandments are different. Look at First John 5 and verse 2. The first, ver the first verse you would love, everyone who believes that Jesus is a Christ has been born of God. Yeah, you, you would love that. All of us would. You must believe that Jesus is the Messiah. You, you've, you've quoted that. But look at verse 2. First, John 5, 2. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and obey His, His God, the Father's commandments. For this verse 3 is the love of God that we keep his, the Father's commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. It's not the point this evening, Brother Moses, friends, brethren, for us to go into delineate all the commandments. What, what, what we are doing, we are, we are not drilling down all, but what we are putting as part of the essentials, I'm putting it on the table that a part of the essential of the gospel has to be the keeping of the commandments of God whatever those are we don't know and is not our remit tonight 
But we already have seen that the definition of sin is the transgression of these commandments. And we, we, we know that the first thing we must do when we come to Jesus is to repent of sin. And therefore we must know what sin is. We must know what sin is. What constitutes sin in the eyes of Yahweh. And therefore it has to be, it recommends itself. It recommends itself that the keeping of the commandments of God, which is the antithesis of sin, which is lawless, there's no law, that is central to the definition of Christianity. And you have helped me because in, in stressing before you leave that righteousness is so important. And the psalm says, all thy commandments are righteousness. In stressing how important it is and how pivotal that is righteousness. You have led me. You have prepared the pitch very well. For me now. To deal with it. So, I will put it to you among the things that I have that this issue which was so central to Peter, whatever the people didn't understand then, one thing they want them to understand that they, they might not have understood all the things that you talked about and all the things that later became fundamental to Christianity, but one thing Peter was make sure that the one thing, you must repent and the baptism that we have you must follow that repentance. Anybody who was going to be baptized must know whether they was a Jew or keep what they, they must know that their heart is right. They must know they would have to know what sin is. They would have to know what the transgression is. And therefore, I put it to you, and we want a dialogue on on this. That it is crucial that we determine the commandments. That it is crucial that we interact with that text in First John three. That sin is the transgression of the law or lawlessness. One. I want to, to mention also, and one thing that was lacking in the presentation, Brother Moses, is you had not, you mentioned the Galatian text about Paul saying that anyone who did not preach his gospel was accursed but you didn't pay any attention to either the gospel that Jesus taught over and over it is in the scriptures I have a number of them it was, it was identified as a gospel of the kingdom of God so by the time we come to Galatians, by the time we come to Galatians, there would already have been a plethora of texts, not to mention the understanding in Judaism, not to mention the understanding among the earliest Christians who would have um, understood the Old Testament and who were Jews. They had an understanding of what the kingdom of God was. And the last time I, 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 I quoted you N.T. Wright, and I recommended this, um, this work by, by N.T. where he pointed out the importance of this concept of the kingdom of God. I quote quote from N.T. Wright in a section called Approaching the New Testament. All right. 
approach in the New Testament. And T. Wright says, Turning the pages of the early Christian writing sometimes seems like turning the tube of a kaleidoscope. The same colors and shapes, but in constantly shifting combinations and patterns. Nothing in the ancient world, whether Jewish or non-Jewish, prepares us for the sudden flurry of themes and images that tumble over one another as the early Christians tried to express and interpret what had happened to Jesus, the world, and to themselves. And they struggled and found meaning within the context of the gospel of the kingdom of God. And the last time I quoted some Old Testament um, passages to you about um, that kingdom of God. Therefore, it would be important for us, it would be important for us to explore what this gospel of the kingdom of God is. When you look at it from its Old Testament roots and understanding, and the last time I had given some, I had given some texts. I know that I had promised to go in Acts 13. I'd given Acts 13, 16, Acts 26, 6, Acts 7, Luke 24, 18. Luke 1, 30, 54, uh, 67, all of these passages which located, which locate, um, uh, rather, the message of salvation and the gospel of the kingdom of God. So, we can't extricate the gospel we can't extricate the death of Jesus from the kingdom of God. And I put it to you that the kingdom of God has to do with a world ruling government that would be on the earth ruling over people who would not all have been obliterated in fact, the notion that we have been given of God coming to the earth, destroying all the wicked, and taking the righteous to heaven, is not found. Wouldn't have, any, wouldn't have any space in the concept of the kingdom of God as taught by the prophets and as taught by Jesus Christ. No concept at all. And therefore I say, what was lacking was this interaction. We must interact with it. The interaction, what is the kingdom of God as defined, as defined by scripture, not as defined by the modern proponents who have totally spiritualized the kingdom. So I put on the, the table that yes, you say that the issue is complex. I respond by saying in all of that complexity, because it was all that complex, let us therefore deal with what? is manageable. And what is manageable is that the people on that day were asked to repent of sin. And my question would be, what is the biblical definition of sin? What would be the expectations of the lifestyle change? What would be the requirements of God? Now, if God is to have a relationship with humans, there must be some requirements. Do you hold a totally antinomian position that the Christian has no requirement because Jesus has done everything for him? Jesus paid it all on the cross. He has already lived a righteous life for us. And therefore, we don't really have to do anything. All we have to do is believe in Jesus, believe in his finished work, and that, that constitutes justification by faith. 
I doubt that you, from your religious tradition, accept that. And also, my final, my final point here before we interrupt. This matter of justification by faith is one that is profound. How do you understand it? You are likely to be a monogist. A monogist believes, uh, no, a synergist, like me. You are a synergist who believes that human beings work in cooperation with, with God. You and I might differ as to what you say the commandments are, but you believe that there are some things that human beings ought to do. Can you stress some more transformation? Are you acquainted with the fact that there is a very prominent view in Protestantism held by Calvin and other reformers that Jesus calls the elect. He saves the elect. He doesn't depend on them to contribute to their salvation. He saves them, to use a Calvinist term, he saves them totally and fully. He does not invite them to be saved. He does not invite them to contribute anything to their salvation. Salvation is totally what God does. That's what is called the monogistic position. Man cannot give God, even the very faith that he has, is a gift. God whom he calls, what they call the, the golden chain, in Romans 8. I'm going to Isaac said you would. We call him justify and we justify. He goes on to glorify. It doesn't depend on what you do. It doesn't depend on what the man does. It depends on God's grace. It depends on God's call. The Bible said the call and the gifts are irrevocable. If you come to that Calvinist position, that's important. And there are some who say, there are some who say anybody who denies that denies the essence of the Bible that what is Christianity is that justification by faith. That salvation is totally what God does. We don't contribute one thing to it. Is that your view? And the Calvinist says transformation would follow because the person is already saved and therefore the seed remains in him that takes and because the seed remains in him he will show the transformation but but he doesn't do anything at all he actually saved and by the way one saved him always saved I suspect you don't accept the, the one saved always saved but the one saved always saved you know comes logically out of the concept that if God saves you, can I come in the world to save the world? If him come to save you, him come to save you. And you can't be unsaved. If you're saved already, you can't be unsaved. I suspect you are closer to me that you believe that some we need to do some things. We might disagree on what the commandments are, but you and I that position of lawlessness seems to really characterize the position I've just given you with, 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 with Calvinism. That you don't need no law, you don't need no normals. Christ is a new normals. You are totally free from law. Once you are in Christ, once you accept Christ and you and, and you and you and, and you have faith in his finished work, it's all done. No, it is Christ living out through you. Therefore, I put it to you as I, as I invite your interaction. And uh, do we have another mic? So we'll bring it to, um, to Brother Moses. So I'm saying to you, therefore, Moses, we we'll bring in IT and Richard after. I say to you, therefore, that central is this matter of sin and its definition. In my view, based on the first John text, we can't say we know him, we are liars, we have to keep his commandments. Sin is the transgression of the law, therefore we have to 
fundamental to the definition of the Christian is a person who is in line with God's law. Fundamental. You are a Christian, you have to be in line with God's law and God's commandments. You can't just be a good man. You can't just be a morally trans. You must be in line with Yahweh's commandments. And I would say, therefore, that before we go even go into whether you need to believe in the deity of Christ and so on, let's deal with what Peter dealt with that day. Him say, must repent of sin. He gives you, the, the word gives you a definition of sin in scripture. You're quoting in a lovely text where it shows that it is a person who has the spirit. The Christian is defined as the person who has the spirit. If any man had not the spirit of God, he is none of his. What defines us as a Christian is the position of the spirit. What do you think Acts 5 says? Acts 5 says that God gives the spirit to those who obey him. And therefore, Brother Moses, I would like us to interact on that. So I am putting in my fundamentals. You have put yours. I am putting in my fundamentals this matter of sin. And I am saying you, you lead me to that. One, by your emphasis on righteousness. And two, because you big up Jesus the Savior so much. You big up Jesus the Savior. Not even so much Jesus the King. Like you big up Jesus the Savior. And if you big up Jesus the Savior, you must big up the sin issue. And I am saying, therefore, that fundamental to the definition of the Christian is a person who is in harmony with God's law. Yes. Speak and see if we can hear you. Uh, many things have been said, many questions asked. Um, we we'll start first with the whole issue of the Acts 2 passage that you read. Yeah. For repenting. No. Yes, the Acts 2 passage about repenting from sin. As you identified, that's very crucial. But the question has to be asked. You know, one of the things I love to do when I seek to understand a passage of scripture is to put myself in the hearer's position, the original hearers. Having heard that from Peter, many sins would have come to mind. Yes. I know you're going. Many sins. However, can we say that they would have known every single sin? I doubt that. I doubt that. Mm -hmm. So I believe here, repenting from sin, yes, is repenting from the sins that you know. Repenting from the attitude of sin, that attitude that would seek to live in this harmony with God and His requirements. All right? But we could not say that they knew every single sin, and that is significant. That is very significant. Why? Because sometimes what we love to do is to identify what sin is and if a particular you know Christian does not hold that to be sin you know we judge them and say they have not repented of sin and I'm saying it's quite possible that they find themselves in the same position as these persons at Pentecost but well, yet we would say that they repented. Um, 
it speaks after about repenting, being baptized, and then receiving the Spirit. You quoted from Acts 5, verse 32, and we are his witnesses to these things, and so also is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. Based upon how you are using the text, what I'm getting, I'm not sure if I'm wrong, but what I'm getting is that you're saying that one has to obey God first. Obey Him in the sense of keeping His commandments. Before He receives the Spirit. I'm saying He would be committed to that. He would be committed to a life of, of obedience. So He would be... Is it that you are saying that he would embrace that attitude of obedience? He would embrace both an attitude of obedience and one, he would have to know, he would have to know what sin um, is. Because, I don't want to break your thought, but um, if you go back, when, perhaps when you engage me on the first John 3, perhaps that's where we will have most of the interest in discussion. Because I'm, I'm putting it to you that um, in 1 John um, 3, the writer would have a, a particular set of laws that would define sin broadly. So it would mean that every individual, every possible sin is... Uh, is being referred to, but there would be a particular corpus of of um, of, of, of laws. So I I, I think the, the thrust of that text, Brother Moses, the Acts five is God, and, and that is, would be in harmony with First John three, that God would not be giving His come His spirit to people who are in a spirit of lawlessness and rebellion and so on. Uh, similar to the text you read, that everyone who who continues in sin, and you're explaining to us that it doesn't mean that you can't fall, it means that a lifestyle. So I think what the Acts 5 is saying is that the person would be a person with, with that lifestyle of obedience to God. So I'm putting it then, in, in my view, in my view, um, God's given his Holy Spirit, that is, that text expresses synergism in that God expects something from human beings. Totally different from the Calvinists, who said, well, salvation is totally what God does. I'm saying that that text shows that God expects something from human beings. He expects obedience. So that's the thrust of my thing. Not to say, no, you might demand, you know, you, you have to have your works first, and, you know, if, if that's probably where you are, you are going. But, yeah, so, uh, yeah, yeah that, I, that, I, that's what I was wondering Yeah, man, I guess, you, I guess you're going there, yeah. you know, and I'm saying, no. If it's an attitude, fine. Yeah. And even based on the context, from verse 30, it says, the God of our fathers raised up Jesus whom you murdered by hanging on a tree. Him God has exalted to his right hand to be prince and savior, to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And then it goes on. Based on the context, I believe that the obedience here was speaking to a specific obedience. The obedience of accepting Jesus as the way, accepting that his death is what brings salvation, obeying God in the sense of accepting the person of Jesus Christ, accepting that he is the Savior, that he is the one who gives repentance, and it is through him that forgiveness of sins is made possible. So, so I see the obedience there within that context. It's a specific obedience. So, the, so God gives his spirit to those who obey God by accepting his son. Accepting that salvation is through him and repentance, forgiveness and so on. You know, I'm just looking at the... That's a big stretch for obedience there. 
because justification as taught in the Protestant tradition is a forensic thing. It's, um, it's not something that one does. You're not really obeying. You're expressing a belief. A belief is not obedience. You see, it's a belief you're expressing. You're expressing a faith that what God has done in Jesus um, is, is salvific. So that's not obedience. You might want to stretch it and say, well, it's obedience in that you are obeying God who invited you to believe in Jesus. It's obedience. But that's not real. That's a, that's a major stretch with the word obedience. Because in the normal usage of obedience, one sees some action from the human being. Something the human being does, not what he believes. It is what he does. In, in contradistinction to what he believes. The belief is the intellectual ascent. So I'm saying that if I believe that Jesus died on the cross for my sins and that as a result of accepting his shed blood, I'll be saved. That's not really obedience in the normal sense in which I would see that word in scripture. That is faith. Which can lead to obedience, but, but that's faith. That that particular aspect of soteriology is faith, not obedience. I would say. You see what I'm saying? But well, we have to allow the author to define his words. All right. Sometimes the author uses a word in a way in which it is not normally used. Okay. It's like even Jesus when they came to Jesus and was asking him about what work. I'm wondering if I can find that text. I think it's in Acts. No, John rather. John 6. Let me see. John 6 verse 28, 29. Then they said to him, what shall we do? Action. Do is an it's action a word. Yes. All right, so when we hear do, we would expect, you know, some action. What shall we do that we may work the works of God? Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God that you believe in him whom he sent. So here Jesus used the word in a rather unique way. You know, not in the normal way. Even when the Apostle Paul, as he was deliberating in Romans, he spoke of uh, the law of faith. Mm -hmm. huh? When we hear of law, normally the normal usage is... We think... Yes. Then commandments and so on. What we do. But here he says law of faith. So, so sometimes, Pastor Boy, and mm -hmm, I'm saying, mm -hmm. you know, the author uses words in, you know, in a different way. Yeah, but, 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 but I'm saying, you know, a context of, of Acts um, 5, what would it be about this context that would lead us to believe that this obeying is simply a faith response I would say three things okay. one the persons who he, were, who he was speaking to yes uh, he was speaking to the Jews uh, especially the leadership of the Jews mm -hmm. they did not accept Jesus yes as a matter of fact they did not just ac not accept him but they fought against him. Yes. You know, led to his death and all of that. Right? So I would say that's one. One reason why the obedience would be so tied to faith in Christ. Two, the preceding verses speaks to Jesus. Mm -hmm. Him being killed, him being exalted, being the prince and savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. Mm -hmm. So I would say that's another. And thirdly, and this is just now from my, you know, rationalistic thinking, 
I am saying what obedience what good works what keeping of which commandments will entitle us to the Holy Spirit many persons do good things mm -hmm. many persons but yet they want nothing to do with Jesus mm -hmm. so if we are saying that it is some good work some disobedience is some keeping of some commandments that would make you be in the position now to receive the Spirit. We would have to say that many other persons are in the position to receive the Spirit. Many persons. Yeah, oh, go on, make it. Yeah, uh, and your point, and then I will. You know, I just want to say that as I read through the New Testament, what I see is that it is the Holy Spirit that enables a man to be obedient. Mm -hmm. So how can I be obedient before I receive the Spirit? Uh, good, um, good objections. Um, first response. It is clear from Scripture, particularly in Romans, that God's call is independent of our work. In fact, Romans is very clear. While, while we were dead in our, our trespasses, a dead man can't work. So it is not our works that draw God's attention to us. The call is by, 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 by grace. Right? So that if I were to say the opposite of that, I would be in contradiction to the clear teaching of Scripture. I want to say, even with that background, um, though, and I agree with you, and in fact, in our teaching, we teach that it is the Holy Spirit that enables one to live a life of righteousness. Every time when I baptize people, I say, well, you know, you have repented of your sins, you know, you don't have the capacity to actually keep the law to, to live a righteous life. It is the Holy Spirit. That gives you that capacity. I do that all the time at baptism. However, there is a spirit of obedience, which is an important aspect of repentance. Because remember, now and again, I keep going back to these debates in Christianity proper. Because a standard Calvinist position would be, you know, that even repentance, there are writers like um, people like Gene Hodges and others who would say that even repentance is not, is not a work. In, in other words, there is nothing that a person really has to do. You come to Christ just as you are. In your tradition, I don't think you you go that you don't go that far. In your tradition, our tradition, just that I I might have certain specific laws that I latch on to. But in the tradition that I know you are from, you believe that a person who comes to repent must change some things, must actually start to show a spirit of obedience. You don't believe that a man still having ways of gunmanship, still having womanizing and all that, that independent of his behavior, him just come and say that he repents. You would say. In fact, the scripture talks about John telling people who are coming to him, about him, say, sure, bring forth the fruits of repentance. So that this text what it speaks to when it says the Lord gives his Holy Spirit to those who obey um, him. In my view, the person who is coming to repent of sin must first know what sin is. In coming to repent of sin, he knows what sin is and he must give his accent, his accent to going against the life of sin. That constitutes obedience. The commitment to the life of righteousness, that constitutes the obedience. 
So, my view is a, a robust synergistic view where the human being has to demonstrate some things. Some would say in classical Protestantism, I am off, that's not the gospel. That the gospel is that a man him, him come, him, he, he gives nothing. Not even repentance, by the way. There are some strands of evangelicalism where that teaching is expounded. And I'm saying that you and I would agree that the person who comes to accept Jesus and accept that he's Lord and so on, there has to be some change in his heart. We know him not, him not transformed yet. We know he's not regenerated yet. But there is something that he brings as part of his repentance. That is the obedience of faith that I think is taught here. An obedience of faith. But not faith, Moses, just in terms of an intellectual ascent. I accept that Jesus died on the cross. You must now accept the Lordship salvation. You must accept the implications of that uh, salvation. You must accept that because Jesus died on the cross, you can no longer live in your sin. And therefore, you have an obligation. God sees that in your heart and grants the Holy Spirit. I am saying most definitely is not granting the Holy Spirit to somebody who has not repented. The repentance constitutes the obedience. Right. I know each. We're going to come to you. But I want, I want Moses to read first, um, the first John 3 before. And I say, okay, you must finish with the sex, but let us read today. At least give me something about that definition of sin. There in, in the first John 3. It was um, lastly do on the Acts passage. Sorry? The, oh, yeah, the, the passage in Acts. Yes. You know, as I said, I, I identified what I believed obedience there is in yes. that context. Okay. Uh, I still believe. I still hold to that. All right. But in terms of repentance, yeah. you know, coming to God, having an attitude to serve God, to turn away from the lifestyle of sin. I'm in total agreement with that. In agreement with that. I'm in agreement with that. I'm not in agreement. You will equate that with obedience. You don't think that's that's obedience. obedience, but I don't believe that's obedience being spoken of in the context oh. of okay. Acts 5. Mm. But definitely that is obedience. That is obedience? Yes. Okay. And what I'm saying is that I would not, I don't believe though, that one would have to display first in terms of I would have to stop doing what I'm doing now and but, but, then but would you have to have a commitment to it yes a commitment oh, oh well that's a commitment that. yes that's why i say constitutes obedience yeah the commitment yeah. definitely yeah. so i just want to make that distinction yeah, man. between committed commitment to it. yeah and actual as you as doing it yeah yeah no so i don't know people have ever appeared at time of doing all of these things oh, but yeah. there must be a commitment a to commitment it. Good. yeah once you understand what sin is there must be a committed commitment not to live in a way of sin yeah yeah that's what I think. Yeah. And I believe that as well. The first John three. three. The definition of sin. The definition yeah. of sin. At least one of. Yes. So whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. Or sin is the transgression of the law. Now the view that I hold is that the law as understood during biblical times was not broken up into moral and ceremonial yeah, yeah. and any other that we want to put to it mm -hmm. but that it was seen holistically yeah, as a whole as a whole mm -hmm. now 